Hey, spinners, it's Chester here, reminding you for your safety to stay seated with that seatbelt fastened good and tight as you spin. Come on, buddy, get with the beat. W Radio, your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 706. And together, as we have been for nearly 18 years, we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, Marvel, Star Wars, the people behind the magic, and more here on the podcast, my weekly live video, events, blog, and more. Please be sure to join the community, subscribe to the podcast, and find everything else at www.radio.com. Adventure is out there, and Duan Rivers has experienced it as an executive in the Walt Disney World Resorts, theme parks, Aulani, Disneyland Paris, Disney Cruise Line, and beyond, and this week, He joins me to share stories and lessons from his time at Disney and the power of saying yes. We're also going to celebrate WW Radio's 18th anniversary this week with something new and old. Stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week and more updates and your voicemails at the end of the show. And if you like what you hear, please help share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax. And enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. Walt Disney is quoted as saying you can design and create and build the most wonderful place in the world, but it takes people to make the dream a reality. And his vision of what would eventually become Disneyland has expanded beyond the four corners of that one park to destinations and experiences around the world, just as the career of my next guest has done as well. From his first role in Walt Disney World, Juan Wivers' wild ride uh, Mm -hmm. embodies and embraces the ideology of Seize the Adventure. I am incredibly excited to be sitting down uh, here at Disney's Wilderness Lodge with Juan Rivers. Welcome. Thanks, Lou. It's... uh... An honor to be sitting here and talking to you. You have a, a, a wonderful reputation, but you know we set this meeting up in Wilderness Lodge. This is the the resort that allowed me to sort of venture into my executive role. This is my first GM job right here. So walking through the doors, I think you saw me. I'm looking up, uh, super impressed with this place. Looks as amazing today as it did uh, back then. So thank you. Glad, glad to be here. I'm not going to lie. I specifically position, positioned myself facing the door because I wanted to watch your expression <laughs> as you will. And I'm like, if he cries, I'm going to videotape because it's going to be gold <laughs> just to get him. <laughs> so you were, uh, you know, you were looking down before you were looking around. But so just very quickly, h- how did you feel walking back into this space that was that was not only your home, but was your home? Yeah, this is a, a true sense of nostalgia. Um, I go into places and I quickly get transported back to that time period. I remember, you know, standing on the top floor looking down. We celebrated our fifth anniversary and balloons are dropping and cast members are cheering. And it was it was awesome. Uh, I also remember when we had to shut the pool down and how that was. (laughs) And that was challenging. So all those emotions uh, sort of rushed through. You and uh, but the good thing about, you know, uh, working and experiencing Disney for 33 years, I can truly say that all the experiences I've had have uh, have been awesome. I mean, at least that's what I remember. The awesome part, (laughs) even though we know that uh, there are challenges there. All right. So I am a sucker for a superhero origin story. And I think our discussion today will reveal just what a superhero you are, not just at Disney, but after Disney. So tell me the tale of young, wide-eyed Duan growing up who knew from an early age exactly what you wanted to do and did not follow that path. Exactement, as we say in, uh, in French. 
Yeah, so um, from a very early age, probably age five, I knew that I wanted to be a physician. So I was going to be a doctor. Everything I did was geared to become a physician. I only hung out with friends that were also going to be doctors and physicians. So that's all it was. I um, picked the one reason why I selected Emory University was because it had a, a very, very good um, um, pre-med program that sort of prepared people for med school. Um, but, you know, fast forward as I sort of travel through uh, my academic years, I had an opportunity to work at Grady Memorial Hospital in the surgical trauma unit. And over the four months I worked there, if you've never been to Atlanta and sat through their surgical at Grady Memorial Hospital, that's an adventure in itself. Just go sit in the lobby. I mean, during the course, during the time I was there, I saw gunshot victims, uh, stab victims, people that were run over by trains. It was just a mess. And I'm a happy guy, man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very optimistic person, and I quickly realized that this is not something that I could do. But even then, I, I sort of st- stuck with it until graduation. And then uh, I realized that I'm not going to med school. I need to get a job. Um, so part-time job at uh, Marriott Marquis downtown Atlanta was where I started. Um, I uh, had an opportunity to check in two Disney executives during that time period, and um, one of which was there. Uh, Tony Jenkins was there recruiting for the college program, I think, at the Atlanta University Center. And he's like, you really need to look at Disney. And at the time, I was like, hey, I, got an em- I have a degree from Emory. Are you kidding? <laughs> I worked at Disney on Main Street, confectionery shop in high school. I don't know if that's a career because all my friends are going to go to med school. Obviously, I can't do that. But then um, I uh, somehow maneuvered my way into an interview with uh, Bob Small, the late Bob Small, who was the VP of resorts and uh, had an incredible conversation. That in itself is a, is a story. But, um, but that's how I returned to Disney. Um, and my first job was at uh, the Grand Floridian Beach Resort on the opening team there, uh, Bell Services Manager. So quickly take us back to your time on Main Street in high school. High right? school. So what brought you there? Like, were you a Disney fan as a kid, or what was it about Disney other than the fact that maybe it was in your backyard? And was it, like, the cool place to work? Were your friends doing it? Yeah, everyone worked at Disney. <laughs> it was in the backyard. We all did it. My father was the executive chef here. So uh, there was that There was that attachment. And, uh, I mean, he, was, he worked with the company for over uh, 25 years. And it was the thing to do. Um, the full circle experience, I don't know if you know this, but the full circle experience for me was my very first job was at Smucker's Corner on Main Street, mm. which is a different story now. But, but if you walked, if I, the young Dwan Rivers, would have walked out of the, the Smucker's Corner store and looked to his right, that's where my window sits today. <laughs> and it's unbelievable to think that that could happen. Because uh, back then, when we went through traditions, which was three days yeah. um you had a chance to 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 tour um, main street and people gave you the stories very iconic people who were instrumental in getting disney to where it is now so to be a, a a part of that legacy and to have the connection from my high school days to the day that i uh left the company and retired is uh, was pretty special so great full circle experience so it's literally a main street to management journey you know with a little bit of a <laughs> Again, a sort of a circuitous gap, gap in between. Talk to me a little bit about that experience opening up what is, and for a lot of people still remains, sort of the, the flagship resort at Disney. Wow, it was. So back up, prior to that, my resort experience or hotel experience was the Marriott Marquis in downtown um, Atlanta. So big, big, big city, big city um, um, hotel. And so the first thing, that I could not understand when I came to Disney is that uh, it was, they just had these conversations about we have to clean every room. And I'm like, I just, I'm like, I can save you guys a lot of money. Like you wouldn't, why, you, why are you cleaning every room? That doesn't make sense. But the idea of a hotel running at 98% or 99% occupancy is unheard of. It just, just doesn't happen. And so um, that was my first revelation when I, when I started with Disney. 
But opening the Grand Floridian Bell Services team, Craig Hodges was the leader. Uh, we had incredible, uh, an incredible team of super dedicated people. I mean, the Grand Floridian was and still is, uh, you know, the most premium hotel we have on site. But it was also the hotel that sort of launched the growth of the hotel division. Uh, and from that point on, we just kept building more and more and more hotels. So we, we set the standard of what quality service and what luxury would, would be, um, for the future of Walt Disney World. And, you know, our leadership at the time did not, um, take that for granted. And I think today you can still walk to that property and see it, but there's some crazy stories from, you know, the, the beach boys and, the grand opening and the jacuzzi to um, um, uh, just a ton of sort of like <laughs> unique things. And I, and I, I had an opportunity to make a recommendation on something. And I think that one thing really fueled my um, desire to, to stay with this thing. Cause I honestly thought it was going to be a two year stint and, 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 and go back into the outside world. But, the, if you walk up to the Grand Floridian today, you'll see the Bell Services guys taking luggage from the Porta Cashier to the luggage room. Well, they're walking underneath a covered area. That covered area didn't exist. And luggage, believe it or not, it rains in Florida. And it rains every day in Florida. And luggage used to get wet every day. And so I went to my boss and said, I have an idea. I think we should build a corridor, cover this. We can protect the luggage. We won't have so many guest complaints. And... uh um, it'll make the operation that much better. And he's like, great idea. So we sketched it out, put it in plan work, and it was built. And I was like, wow, this is a company that listens to people. And I always realized that, you know, the way I felt, I wanted to make sure as I grew with the company, I made other feel, other people feel like they were listened to, that if you have a great idea, um, go for it. You know, Meg Crofton was one of our previous presidents, and she always used to say, Hey, don't give up on your ideas. You know, it, it just might be a timing issue. Don't go for your last strike. If you got a great idea, go for it, go for it, hold off. You know, and I've, I've, I've kept that in, in the back of my head throughout my career. And that's happened many times where you come up with an idea and, and you get shot down. Luckily, they did, that worked and I got motivated to stay. But there are other times I like to encourage people, don't get, don't get discouraged because your idea or your concept was not uh, accepted immediately. Give it time, finesse it, go back at it again. If it's a good idea, it'll, it'll eventually happen. Well, I think there's two takeaways there. One is about you, the individual, having that drive and desire to continuously want to improve, even if it quote unquote wasn't your job, like you had these ideas and Disney as a company listening with, with open ears, right? right? Being open to ideas as opposed to this is your job, just go do your thing. So it's, it's, it's a combination of, the person as as well as the the corporation the corporate culture has to be one that that's open to it exactly exactly and uh when those two things meet you have a great marriage um when those when you're in conflict with those two things one or the other typically gives um but i also think it's uh if you're tenacious enough and you um have the ability to influence people which is another skill that people need to hone in on uh, you can get a lot of things done. I've known people who, um, you know, unsuccessful people have tried things and then you have someone else will do the, and say the exact same thing and somehow it gets done. And the, and the other person sits back, I have the same idea. <laughs> well, you did, but this person is more, um, had greater influence. And, and that's a, a skill set I think people still need to hone in on and finesse. You know, as, as you look at, and we're going to go through, obviously, your resume and your time at Disney, you know, there's some people who look at somebody's resume and be like, wow, you bounced around to a lot of different jobs. You clearly don't have focus. I look at it the other way. I look at it as he was in such great demand and had such innovative and creative ideas that, one, he was wanted by other sections of the company, and two, had that passion and desire to want to I imagine, I'm guessing, because we've only met twice, that you don't sort of like staying in one place for a long time. You want to sort of see how you can help and improve elsewhere. So you go from Wilderness Lodge, I'm sorry, you go from Grand Floridian on the opening team to 
you know, 10 years later, you go over to, you come here to Wilderness mm-hmm. Lodge mm-hmm. and you take over as the general manager. That's correct. That's correct. So, you know, I think you have to do what you love and you have to be passionate about what you do and still take a lot of advice. Um, I moved around a lot, but I also moved around a lot because we were growing the hotel business from the Grand Floridian to the opening of the Yacht Club and the Beach Club and then Dixie Landings and Port Orleans and then All-Star Resort. So the Disney, Disney decade, the Disney decade, there was a decade. lot happening. Yeah, a lot happening. And, um, you know, there was one point I was, you know, yeah, I was very expressive about my desire to grow with the company. And I remember I talked to my boss. He's like, well, you're moving around a lot. And I was like, well, you guys are moving me around a lot. <laughs> but that was who I was. And because I had an opportunity to work in every level of resorts, whether it was the Grand Floridian, this, the moderates, premium, all the way down to the value and all star. It really taught me a lot about running the hotel business and the value of each of those segments. None of which I think are any more important than the other. I mean, the all star is a very important part of our business. And so is the Grand Floridian. And so is the contemporary, whether you have convention resorts or, uh, or lease resorts. So they're all important, but oftentimes people can get, um, uh, can, can somehow get swayed to think that one is more important than the other. But if you, but if you believe in the business and you believe in what we do as a company, providing great opportunities for all guests, then you'll understand the importance of it. So for me, it was great. I'm a guy who likes to move around. I, I'm a hand raiser. I was like, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Do you know how to do it? I'll figure it out. Give me an opportunity. And I think because my background was in, uh, was in economics, um, coming from Emory, and I didn't go through your traditional hotel background. I wanted it more. I tried harder. I got more frustrated um, during that matriculation process uh, because I'm like, I, I need to grow. What is it? And so to to jump into as many opportunities that that uh, that I could uh, was helpful. Fast forward, I think it translate to wow, this guy. Let's if we don't know where we're gonna. If we need something done, we don't know who's going to do it. All right, maybe Dewan can do it. That's a good reputation to have. And, so, yeah. and that's how I think I ended up in the cruise line. We, we, you know, cruise line is the biggest, most successful niche product we had. But if you remember, we, we started off on some rocky grounds back then. <laughs> and so to be able to go from a trying to think how many general managers have ever been hotel directors one kevin myers i think but i don't know anybody else has left their nice cushy experience at walt disney world and go and live on a ship for three months four months at a time um, and that's tough you know you work 20 hours a day seven days a week now the contracts are really nice but my first contract was for four months and then my replacement didn't show up so it ended up being six months without any time off but nonetheless i mean developing a reputation that says I'm willing to do anything. I can do anything is a, uh, is a good trait. Uh, stability also helps because people will challenge that, but I think you still have to do what you love and what you want and the, things will work out. And it's interesting because if you look at this sort of section of your career, Grand Floridian, Wilderness Lodge, All-Star, Magic and Wonder, Disney Reservation Center, you really touch all aspects of the hotel industry and the many different and disparate yet connected elements. So you're able to bring something that you learn from one and then take it over to the other. Talk about how not just in, you know, predictable guest turnover every three, four, seven days, but how being a director on the ship brings both challenges as well as opportunities. Yeah. So taking your hotel experience and then bringing it on to a cruise ship is great. And the reverse, bringing what you learn on the cruise ship back to the hotel business is, it's also, um, fantastic. But, you know, on the cruise line, you get to deal with, it's the greatest experience. So imagine having a controlled environment where regardless of the, uh, the attendance, um, you get, you get, you get to produce that incredible experience each and every time. So you're not like reducing fireworks on Tuesdays and Thursdays because the population is low. You're not, you're not reducing your staff because on, on, you know, for the next month we're going to be low. No, you, you get, you get, you get to, you get to go out 
every single day with a hundred percent on your game. And, um, our guests get to experience that. And it, it turns out, and that's one of the reasons why they have, you know, some of the highest guest ratings, um, uh, on property or within the, within the division. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the cruise line, uh, business and how they interact with their, their guests is spectacular. Imagine you have, when I was on board, I'm sure it's probably even more complex between 60 and 70 different nations of people from around the world. And these individuals are coming and going on contracts every three, four, six, eight months at a time. And also leadership is coming and going the whole time. So when everyone, when, so when people say, oh, there's, there's too much mobility and not enough stability, go work for the cruise line. It's embedded <laughs> within the, with, with, within how they do this. Um, but when you have a, a strong vision, great leadership, everyone, um, both shore side who does a lot of the detail planning and those who execute on the ship, you can deliver an incredible experience. And, you know, you've been on them probably multiple times and you've seen it, uh, firsthand. And what's interesting about that is, is the ability to create and maintain a sense of, of I hate to say corporate culture, but culture, right? Is mm-hmm. this this philosophy that has to be ingrained in every cast and crew member day one that they walk in the door that they start facing guests? It has to be part of that. So even with that turnover, not just in guests but in cast and crew, being able to make that's always what amazed me about Disney. And the first time I ever went on Disney Cruise Line, I said, "How are they going to take this? How are they going to take this experience with no attractions, with no things, and then bring it on to forget the fact that it's just a moving." you know, city at sea, but I w- I've always amazed just from a customer service and a, and a cultural level. Sometimes it almost feels even stronger there um, in terms of the way that the crew makes us as guests feel, right? This is this is a company built on emotion, right? It's a way that, that you as not just management, but, but front-facing cast and crew make us feel. What well, a unique thing about the cruise line business is it's almost – Similar to what our guests are going through. It's an immersive, all inclusive experience for our crew. The crew does not go home. They're there with their peers. They're with, they're with the guests. They're not worried about the, the, the daughter's dental appointment. They didn't have a, their car didn't break down. They're not worried about, they're worried about delivering that experience to the guests all day, every day while the time is there, while, while they're there. And so you don't necessarily have to go back and forth between multiple roles. You are fully immersed as a cast member, just as much as the guest is fully immersed as part of it. But, but number two, um, the, the indoctrination and the enculturation. And every time someone returns, like they go home, they come back, they go through uh, a, uh, a period where they're being caught up, reminding them what's new, what's different. So you really do have the ability to, um, keep your cast member base in a, in a bubble as well. And I think they, they really appreciate it. And remember, these are cast members from around the world and the, and the, the idea of working for Disney is just a dream. Um, sort of like what you went through back in, you know, when you sold everything and moved down here. A lot of people come here with these dreams of working here. Um, but you get to get trapped in that dream. You know, you don't have to, yeah, go home every day. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about this before, this idea of this. There's always been this. I remember as a kid, working for Disney was like this brass ring. Like you had to be like the elite of the elite. And I think that you still do because I think there is this sense of what this culture has to be. And, you know, you can, quote unquote, train anybody to do anything, but you're hiring for what's within. Very quick tangent. What is it about Disney? You talk about how yeah. traditions used to be four days. Now it's half a day. And I think that that's unfortunate for a lot of reasons. But you still see that in 99.9% yeah. of the cast members. Yeah. How? How does that happen? Well, one of the things I mentioned is that I'm, I'm loving retirement, <laughs> obviously. Um, but I think I might get out and start talking a little bit more. But one of the things that I've sort of uh, learned over my uh, years at Disney is, and which really came to uh, fruition with my time at uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom, and uh, the things I'm going to talk about in the future is, is about you know management responsibility, the core essence of who we are, and this thing called spirit of soul. 
And so I remember starting at Disney's Animal Kingdom. And Animal Kingdom has a reputation of everyone who works there, they're like, this place is special. Every park is special, right? But you go to Animal Kingdom, like, oh, we're special, we're unique. There's this... <laughs> we could work in the heat and in polyester. We could in polyester. <laughs> and, um, you know, then people go... And back, and back then, people were like, yeah, that's also because you're like, your operating hours are short. If I work there, I'll be there. <laughs> but there was something more. And I think it had to do with... You know, you've heard us talk about in the past uh, role versus purpose... And you've seen a lot of, you've heard a lot of conversations about that. But in Animal Kingdom, we, we called it the, the spirit or the soul of the park. And I think if you can, um, um, if we can continue as a, as a company to get cast members to not only buy into their particular job, but we also have to make sure everyone within the supply chain, whether you're a dishwasher or the VP or general manager or the person behind the register, that what we're doing and what they're doing is bigger than the individual task. That we are, you know, to some degree, that family who is, we're not, you used to think of it as like, you can fall short of saying we're saving the world, but we're, but we're, we're, we're saving families. We're saving, uh, distraught people who are burnt out and worked every day and, and unfortunately me, live in the same house with their family, but don't spend a lot of quality time. So when they come here, that cash member needs to realize that they are creating a lifelong experience for that individual, that they're going to look at pictures and they're going to be in the picture. Remember Jimmy, the popcorn guy? And uh, we need to, we need to continue to do that. And, you know, Animal Kingdom, not only did we do that, we also had the ability to, to, to rally people around conservation and our, um, in our, the importance of animal, animal care. And when people realize that what we do, uh, has this greater purpose and they themselves, whether it's raising money for the Disney Conservation Fund or talking to our guests about their individual experience with their favorite animal, I think people not only will do their job, but they will do this discretionary effort. They'll, they'll do more than their job. They'll do, they'll, they'll do more if they feel like what they do. You know, the pandemic and everything in between has caused people to seriously rethink why they are doing what they're doing each and every day. And if we as leaders can't convince them that what they're doing each and every day has extreme purpose, then I think we could, uh, we can lose cast members easier because uh, people have options. Yeah, I went to a podcast conference last weekend to hear um, someone speak. It's no surprise to you, but I'm like, look how many podcasters are. <laughs> people are turning in their their attorney bag yeah. and becoming podcasters or whatever. <clears throat> There's all these other sort of solopreneur uh, experiences that people are developing. And they no longer have to work for us. They no longer have to get in the car and drive and deal with I-4 traffic and come here. But we, whether it's here at Disney or some other company, need to figure out how to get people to realize that's important. Their presence here, their engagement with our our guests, uh, they are all critical. And uh, by doing that, you can you can you can keep that culture going on and continue to get people to have this. Uh, desire to want to be here and, and work 33 years, you know. That's a- and this feeling that we as, as guests, that that cast member that is making eye contact with you, whether it is a cashier, back of the house, up to Josh tomorrow in the parks, making the eye contact, making you feel like you are the most important, most special guest there is the differentiator. But you talked about um, th- these these changes and being recognized and and you know, you being the guy that constantly raised his hand, I think there was this level, there was this shift for you because you go from working sort of in and at the resorts and cruise lines to becoming vice president for new business development at Disney Parks and Resorts. Explain in, in layman guest terms what that means, what a day-to-day looked like for you. Did Disneyland Paris? For, so in 2007? Oh, Right? Did you you were that was yeah, new business development? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so those who were here remember that Disney was really interested in building footprints around the world. 
But as you know, when we build a footprint, we spend a lot of money. We <clears throat> theme parks are not cheap. They're in the billions. But it's also important to figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, how do we how do we build a Disney experience away from the berm? How do we build a Disney experience that doesn't require all this infrastructure? And I remember there was a lot of talk about that, going to New York, going to here, going yeah. You, you heard them all. I mean, we, we had successful projects, and we had unsuccessful projects. Virginia didn't work out. This project worked out. We announced, we announced things. Things were pulled back. Um, so I worked with um, Bob Weiss, who recently left, on, a, a, on an international project. And um, one of the things he would always um, reference, which I've – have thought about and, and as I think about developing my think my 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 presentation in the future is this thing called your core essence, and so it's really about who are you like what do you represent? Um, if you strip away everything else, Disney is known for innovation, technology, creativity, and so when you get that down to a science, no matter where you are where you are in the world, if a guest walks through that experience, you go, like, well, you know what, I may be here but this feels just like a disney experience mm -hmm. and so new business development was tr we were looking at projects around the world to create new businesses shanghai was a big discussion point back there and now shanghai is uh is there um, other projects that we were working on are not there but you know that was that was one of the ones that we were looking at regional resorts was was on the table how do you build resorts everywhere what we originally uh, we're looking at um, uh, ultimately ended up with this great project in Hawaii. And Alani is a byproduct of that, that thinking back in that generation of how do we build a Disney experience literally not only away from, you know, the berms, but away from the <laughs> core 48. And uh, I had an opportunity to do that project. So before we jump over to Alani, because again, it was this sort of, relatively positive seismic shift in what Disney was doing. I know that there was a lot of concepts that sort of came and went. And if you can't talk about it, just blink twice. Ah. But I had heard a rumor that Australia was something that was very seriously considered at one point in and around this time period. Yeah, we had. He's blinking twice, by the way. <laughs> there are projects all over the place, right? There are projects all, all over the place. You know, when you go to these, when you're negotiating with, uh, uh, countries, you're trying to, um, you know, create a win-win situation, a win-win scenario. And that win-win scenario is about how do we, um, we want to make sure that we induce tourism or bring tourism to there, but it's also about expanding the brand. So we were, it was always a, I remember being in a meeting with, with Iger once, and it was like, you gotta, you gotta make sure you are expanding the brand, not always taking advantage of the brand. The brand is a brand, you know, we can always leverage it, but how do we expand it to make it bigger, better, create new products, um, somehow bring new guests into the fold? And that was uh, a, a key goal. Um, and the idea was, you know, how do we do, whether it's an, an RDE or a hotel? Retail dining entertainment district like Disney Springs. Those were the objectives out there. We were looking all over the place. I mean, like everywhere. But I mean, there's everything. You have to have the right number of uh, folks that can even get there. You know, you, you have to make sure that if you create this or invest this, is there, are there enough people in the environment that's going to be able to supply this? Yeah. So it's not just the, the pretty picture. You, it's a, as you know, it's a business, a big business. And we have to uh, continue to make sure that it's going to be, uh, one that will, um, you know, continue to drive the brand and, 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 and drive additional revenue, um, streams as well. You know, when you, you talk about a place like Hawaii, it makes perfect sense, right? It, it sounds like the perfect destination for Disney. And in 2008, when you are, Given the role of, of vice president of Alani Resort, this is for you personally. Forget the the company sort of moving over there. You literally are the only Disney person on the island. Like you are the fright. You are the first person sent over. Talk to me a little bit about 
hey, we have a new role for you, and you're going to Hawaii by yourself for a couple of years. Talk to me about that that sort of process um, just at, at the very beginning, and then you know, obviously working with Rodi, and I want to talk about the culture and, and whatnot too. Yeah. Yeah, I was wrapping up um, uh, one of my roles, and I got a call to say, hey, would you be interested in going to a uh, project in Hawaii? That was right around Valentine's Day. And then uh, the comment was, this doesn't need to happen until like November, December. We're just getting um, interest. So I was like, yeah. I mean, I uh, I spent a summer in Hawaii in college. Uh, I was a pearl diver. That was interesting. Actually, I sold jewelry, but I was called a pearl <laughs> diver. Um, so the idea of going back there, this time with a job and not being a, a broke student, was also pretty pretty fascinating. But so, yeah, I get the, the, the comment. I come back, and literally three weeks later, I'm there permanently. So a lot of stuff happened where we realized as a company, if this is going to be a successful project, we need someone boots on the ground immediately. So I had like a week to pack up and get out there, wow. literally. Um, I... Temporary housing. I worked from home um, until I was able to find an office, hired my assistant. Um, we worked together independently for about a year before um, I started uh, increasing the number of people on the team. Joe Rohde and a, a few of the other people all did business trips. So everyone was business tripping in, but I was the, the face of Disney and on the ground working with um, whether it's the uh, the folks on the construction side, but a lot of the, a lot of it was with the community. So, making sure that as we move forward, the cultural community, the business community, were all in sync, completely understood what we were doing, and then me also working with our uh, resort development team in, uh, and and. Uh, um, to ensure that as we build this resort, what, what's going to be sort of unique. But, I mean, it was interesting back in the early days. I mean, the design that you see now was not the design that we originally came up with. It was – we had to go and fight for the fact that, you know, this still needs to be a Disney resort. When mm-hmm. someone walks in there, they need to see that. The original resort was we used codename, codename K. So it was Resort <laughs> K. It was great. So imagine seeing like a, a generic hotel that looks great anywhere else and then you see – proposed resort and so trying to convince people that we have to be disney off the berm and not only do we have to be disney we have to be very disney we have to be very 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 much on the storytelling side but still authentically hawaiian first with a little bit of i sort of a little bit of disney sprinkled on top yeah that was the first thing we learned so we we went in there with our um, you know disney hat on and as i sat down with the community we quickly realized that this thing had a lot riding on it we quickly went big hawaii little d you know little disney big hawaii we had to make sure that it was all about hawaii but done in a disney disney way which sorry, sets the standard for what disney does as they move out to Places like Shanghai and Hong Kong, authentically, authentically. Chinese, and then a little bit of Disney. Uh, yeah, exactly. You have to be authentic to your community, or the community will not support it. And trust me, I, as sitting down with so many people, they were telling me stories of of companies that did not do that and and failed miserably. And I was like, well, that can't happen. Uh, that cannot happen to us. But the early days were uh, amazing. Um, I remember sitting in a meeting after weeks of just being i don't know it was an uphill battle with people just not believing that disney was going to do what we said we were going to do and uh, a gentleman by the name of john defreeze who was one of our cultural consultants he pulled me aside and i was like john i don't get it we're you know we're this was remember i think 2008 the economy was in the toilet there was a lot of un- unemployment and disney was building this massive resort one of the big uh, companies that were that were actually hiring at the time and so I thought that was good enough. It wasn't. Uh, in their minds, you're just another big company coming in, taking advantage of their culture. And so he pulled me aside and said, look, Duan, there's a word called uh, kuli, um, kuliana. And kuliana is a Hawaiian word that's, that really deals with responsibility. And that you, Disney, have, you guys have the responsibility of telling the true Hawaiian story. 
and you know it, that responsibility kind of manifests itself in, into something you know to what we call integrity as well. But they're very much about saying, you know, think of a brand, the Hiltons, the Marriotts, all those guys are great. They do a great job. But when they say something is Hawaiian, will people believe them? Mm-hmm. As Disney says it's going to be Hawaiian, people will believe them. So you got to get it right. And I remember sitting down with the CEO of First Hawaiian Bank. I remember sitting down with um, Uncle Black, who was the the informal voice of uh, the West Side. I remember sitting down with the hula community, the surfing community, the school system, Senator Hanabusa, the governor. I mean, I sat down and was um, really preaching the Disney gospel to, to everyone. And in the end, the support that we have from the community, building a truly sort of this, everything about the resort was dedicated to Hawaii. Because a lot of people will go to Hawaii and they will think that it's, they'll see something and it could be Tahitian, it could be Fijian, it could, it could be from some other South Pacific uh, region. But we want to make sure we dispelled all that and really highlight it. So the resort itself is built in the form of Ahu Pua'a, which is very instrumental in Hawaiian culture as, as far as land management and this ability to work with each other. Um, once again, in Kuleana, um, the responsibility of uh, ensuring that the what you do and what you say you're going to do, you're going to do it. And that's a leadership principle. I mean, leaders have that need to, to do what we say we're going to do and the integrity around that is important as well. Um, so that was... Uh, I think, um, well, for me, it was one of the, the, the greatest experiences I had in my career. And every time I go back to Hawaii, even now, people will still comment and say, you know, no one's done it like Disney. You know, the, 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 the impact you guys left was absolutely amazing. So I feel like the, the work we did um, and the reputation we built um, paid off uh, just loads tremendously you know when people mention alani and associate a name with it 99.999 percent of the time it's joe rody we'll talk about joe but i was thinking about you and your role and i I love the way you told the story because as i was thinking about chatting with you today i said i cannot fathom the enormous amount of pressure that must have been on you because you have this construction project on one hand that's 800, 900, whatever the number is, it's up there. We'll call it a billion just to round the number up. But you're also working with local communities. You're working with the local government. You're learning about Hawaiian culture and ensuring and promise, making a promise to the people of Hawaii that you will authentically integrate that into the resort. You're thinking about you know, making sure the environmentality and that the environmentally friendly initiatives as you're building it have to be first and foremost in design and construction. You have all these different aspects of the business sort of creating demands on you. Oh, by the way, balancing the business requirements with storytelling and guest and experience. Is the overwhelm as as massive as I'm imagining it? It's a lot. You know, but I think between Jim Kwasnowski, who originally started the project on the construction side, Joe Rohde on the design side, and my uh, being able to influence the operation component of the resort and the the community piece, those three, the three of us working together uh, were was truly the answer to make sure that no one person got overwhelmed. I think my... Um, my foundation that I built made it a lot easier for Joe and for the gym as they interacted because we've already built a level of trust. And, um, it, but we knew that what we were doing, um, had a great deal of pressure on us. I remember in the early days talking to one of the, um, very tough sort of cultural folks and he pulled me aside and said, Dwan, if you get this wrong, on opening day, we will burn down your hotel. <laughs> there will be burning tires and we will we will destroy it. And I was like, you got to give me a chance. <laughs> like, you haven't even given me a chance. Listen to us. And that's not a metaphor. Like, we literally will burn down your we, hotel. They, and, and he was right because they've burned down other structures. So it's not, <laughs> it's not, it wasn't a joke. 
but we went from having that sort of friction relationship in the early days to I remember spending time with him and his family on New Year's Eve, uh, my last year there on the beach. And he just was, you know, super, uh, you know, thankful about what Disney did. It was to go from an extreme dislike to an extreme uh, like was, it's just a huge, a huge jump. You know, we've, you know, we've had experiences where, um, we've had to fight back from that on projects and some projects didn't even happen because of the conflict with the community. So we've learned a lot that you cannot, and just, you just see how important we are here in the Orlando community and all the communities that we're in. That's, that's, that's fundamental to making sure we deliver, um, to our guests is that we deliver to our, our community because that, that's our source. You know, you can't ignore that. Those are the people that will work here and support you and so forth. And you learn lessons about, you know, you can't just sort of go and build a theme park and assume that the culture, the, the culture that is there, French, <clears throat> Chinese, whatever, is just going to adapt to the way that Disney wants to do things. There has to be this, this marriage in between the two. But I would be remiss if I did not ask on behalf of the person who's metaphorically sitting with us. You know, Joe Rohde is is a, a remarkable creative and a personality. Talk to me a little bit about the experience of working with him, what he brings, and, and maybe things that you, working with him, things that you helped Joe with and things that maybe Joe taught you. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I was able to do for Joe was to smooth the road for him as he came in and the creative team came in. Um, Joe's originally from Hawaii. He was born there. So he had this extra sense of Kuleana responsibility to make sure it happened, right? Cause that's his, that's his home, that's his home state. And so, you know, working with Joe, he's a force to be reckoned with. One of the smartest guys I know. He made sure that anyone who touched anything from a design perspective, they were deeply entrenched on the cultural side. I think he had like a list of 10 or 12 books that people had to get through and master before they had an opportunity to get out there and start touching something. So it was very important that the two of us collaborated closely um, on what we were doing and what we were thinking. Um, WDI takes full control on the creative side, on things that we do. It's probably one of the first projects that we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to step back a little bit, and we want the community of Hawaii to help with our design. So... The hotel has the largest collection of contemporary Hawaiian art in the world. The outside, uh, fresh, the outside massive images are all Hawaiian artists, not Disney artists. They're all Hawaiian artists. Um, when you walk through the resort, all the work that you see, or, uh, all the work that you see, the work is done by, uh, native Hawaiians. Um, Joe and I talked a lot back in those days and being able to, for me to go out and set up a meeting and then uh, for Joe and his team to come in and just make sure that we did it right. And then at that point, Joe and his team, they went out and set up meetings. I wasn't even there, but we've already, we already have the, the, the ears of people. And at that point, um, and I think what the, the, the true lesson is you have to listen a lot before you talk. You have to listen a lot before you act and sometimes, even though you're the expert, and we feel, and we are the experts, we, who does it better than Disney? But we also realized that we were not experts in Hawaii. We were not experts uh, with um, um, what they themselves wanted to see. So we had to listen a lot. And that listening, that caretaking, and then for the design team to go back and, and uh, produce it. It's almost like, I akined it to my time at the Grand Floridian. I was like, I have a great idea. And they did it. The the people we work with in Hawaii said, I have a great idea. I think you guys should do it this way. And we did it. And they were like, holy, I can't. No, you know, we've had these conversations with multiple companies. And no one's ever, no one's ever done it. And so that's, you know, again, I look at everything that you do as a stepping stone to the next place that you go to. So, and believe me, I could spend all day asking questions about it. Alani, but your career continues to, to span farther and wider and deeper because next you go over to Disneyland Paris. Uh, you the Vice President? That concludes part one of my conversation with Duan Rivers, whose story 
and history and experience is fascinating. We have so much more that we have to cover, including his time over in Disneyland Paris as vice president of Disney's Animal Kingdom, his work with the volunteers program, his window on Main Street USA, lessons from Disney and his incredibly fascinating life after Disney, which involves mountains and planes, like airplanes, not flat planes, mountains and planes, and living life with and without a parachute. It is incredibly fascinating. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Please tune in again next week. February 11th, 2023 marks 16 years since the very first episode of WW Radio was published, although I've been podcasting every week for nearly 18 years since early 2005 when my first podcast, Mouse Tunes, debuted with me and my co-host. That came to an end on February 4th, 2007, and the following week, February 11th, WW Radio was born in a six-minute and 36-second podcast that was meant to introduce and kickstart this new, somewhat scary, step into a new adventure for me. And that first show still makes me cringe a little, but it represents more than just my awkward initial journey down a very new, very unknown, and circuitous path. And along the way, I've endeavored to improve the show and to serve you as best as I can and strategically innovate in creative and new ways. From our discussion forums to my first weekly live video in 2007 to carrying my laptop through the Disney parks to bring you with me live and connect you to the experience to binaural audio from the parks, virtual audio tours, a magazine, 360 degree videos, etc. I'm always looking to what's next and how I can improve the show and community for, and more importantly, with you. And I love that although we've been around for a long time, every day there are new friends who discover the show, site, and community and become part of our WW Radio family. And inspired by that, I've always looked to create content on the show that is evergreen, meaning that it's not necessarily or always time sensitive. And when appropriate, I want to make the episodes relevant, not just when they're published, but years, or in some cases, over a decade later. From interviews to the DSI Disney scene investigations, top tens, reviews, reports, guides, and more, there's a lot that you may have never heard if you found the show at number 700, number 400, or even 200. And while all shows are always available in the podcast feed and on www.radio.com, each show has its own page, player, and show notes, and there's a convenient jukebox at www.radio.com slash jukebox where you can find and listen to every episode from a single page. I also know that with more than 839 episodes in the feed, because they also include some of the weekly newscasts and even a few videos in the feed way back when, It's a lot to try and navigate through and find. And I get questions and requests all the time about certain topics, places, people, and yes, even food that I may have covered on a past episode. And that one little spark of inspiration prompted something that's actually going to become even bigger. Because beginning this week, I'm going to add a second episode to the WW Radio feed. First things first. You don't have to do anything. Nothing changes for you other than getting an additional show every week. And I first intended on bringing you a carefully curated past episode, which we're going to call From the Vault. Yes, there's a slight little bit of Disney inspiration there. And each week, I'm going to select a past show from the WW Radio archives and insert it into the feed. But I'm going to do a short introduction for context, including explaining why I chose that episode, what to listen for, and, you know, who knows? We'll see where this is going to take us. But that idea opened up what I think is another great opportunity. Because I continue to make shows that are not only evergreen, but relevant, valuable, and consistent, and have you noticed, other than that painful first episode, I've never monologued another show or done it without a guest or co-host, But I am sometimes constrained by a number of other factors which preclude me from covering some things on the show in different ways. But now, with this new episode in the feed, I'm going to introduce and 
experiment with a couple of different types of content in a variety of formats. For example, maybe one week, instead of a show from the vault, I might do a show about something that is time sensitive. Instead of a top 10, maybe I'll do a top five show. Maybe I'll do it a solo. Maybe I'll do other shows on my own as well. Maybe even I'll resurrect my Disney in a minute segments, but in audio format. I can also take and welcome ideas and inspiration from you and we'll go from there. We can even talk about more Marvel, Star Wars, and other aspects of our fandom and love of Disney and just see where this takes us. I think it opens up a world of opportunities in an effort to do more for and with you to bring you more fun, value, laughter, maybe even a little inspiration. Now, the new shows are going to appear in your feed on or around every Thursday. So you're now going to get the main show on (laughs) Monday-ish, the additional life gets in the way, the main show on Mondays, the additional episode on Thursday, and still the WWE Radio Live video show and chat on Facebook every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern at www.radiolive.com. Now, one thing that is very important and I want to make very clear, well, I'm going to be creating and bringing you a lot more content, both from the vault and a variety of new shows and episodes. I am not going to keep any of this content behind any type of paywall or make it exclusive for the WW Radio Nation Patreon community. If you like what you hear, and I hope that you do, all I ask is that you continue to spread the word. And if you really like, and it's totally optional, but very much appreciated, very helpful, you can help support the show by being part of the Nation family for as little as a dollar per month at www.nation.com. And by the way, speaking of the nation, stay tuned as I have some updates and changes coming to and for the nation as well, including, little hint, a new physical reward for all new members at the bronze level and above. So anyway, there you go. More shows in your feed every Thursday. I'm going to take you back in time, share episodes from the WW Radio Vault, bring you new content in terms of timely conversations, short episodes, solo shows, mini reviews, Disney in a Minute, and much more. If you like it, please let me, and more importantly, others know. If you don't, that's okay. Just let me, not others, know. It is an experiment, and we are all in this together. I am so excited about what's new and old and next for us on the show and as a community And none of this happens without you. So thank you for the past 18 years and hopefully at least another 18 more. So let's tune in, choose the good, and keep moving forward. Thank you. It's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details in what you see, hear, remember, or taste. If you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you. And what I mean is that by being part of the WW Radio Nation, you help bring every episode of the show to life, every live broadcast, the contests, giveaways, and events are thanks to, by, for, with, and about you. And you can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar per month and get exclusive rewards every month like scavenger hunts, trivia quests, be part of our group video calls, get access to our private Facebook group, their shirts, stickers, monthly care packages from the parks, early access and discounts to special events and lots more. I appreciate your love, support, friendship, and help, and I love being able to give back to you each and every month. I want to thank some new and longtime members of the Nation family, including Melissa Holstein, Jennifer York, Michael Maliv, and Ariel Garney. None of this happens without you. If you want to find out how you can support the show and be part of the Nation family, please visit www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, we were talking about the music of Disney's Hollywood Studios, which inspired me to ask you this. What opening day, May 1st, 1989 attractions at the Disney MGM slash Hollywood Studios are still open to guests today. First, thanks to all of you who entered. 
got this one correct and knew that the answer was none. Zero, zilch, nada, nothing, donut, goose egg. Because if you remember back to opening day of the Disney MGM Studios, it really was sort of broken into two parts. There was the backstage studio tour, which had a not one, but two hour guided tram tour and an hour long walking portion and the small theme park area as well. That section included the great movie ride, the magic of Disney animation, Monster Sound Show and Superstar Television, as well as some shops and restaurants like the Soundstage Restaurant, but none of those are still available to guests in their original form. So the answer was none. I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week, once again, you were playing for a WW Radio mug, pin, and a mystery prize, and last week's winner, randomly selected, is Gregory J. Stewart. So Gregory, congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away, If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. We're going to stay at Disney's Hollywood Studios this week and go to an attraction that actually is open, Toy Story Mania. And this week, I want you to tell me, what is the highest rank, right? If you get your highest possible score, what is the highest animal rank that you can get on Toy Story Mania? You have until Sunday February 12th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com. Click on the podcast link and this week's podcast. Use the form there. Once again, you're going to play for the pin, the mug, and a mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. Be sure and tune in next week for part two of my conversation with Dewan Rivers. But I want to know in the meantime, we were talking a lot about Aulani. I could have talked to him all day about Aulani and working with Joe Rody and everything about it. But have you ever been there? Have you ever been to Aulani? And if so, what was your experience like there? Be part of the community and conversation. Talk about this and anything about the show Disney, Marvel, or Star Wars in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you have a question you want me to answer on the show, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com, or call the voicemail comment about this week's show or anything you'd like to discuss, even just a hello if you're in one of the Disney parks by calling the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1. Also, be sure and visit www.radio.com. Check out our events page, our blog with our amazing team of writers, back episodes of the show, and more. And also visit loumangelo.com. Find out how I may be able to help you turn what you love into what you do with one-on-one coaching, being part of our weekly mastermind group, or attending one of my events, my, like my Momentum Weekend Workshop, coming back this fall to Walt Disney World, or my Momentum Weekend Retreat, April 28th through 30th. Here in Orlando, there are currently only two spots remaining, but you can still take advantage of the super early bird special. Just visit loumangelo.com, click on Retreat, or send me an email if you have any questions. And if you're looking for a speaker to your event, conference, business, or school, I have a variety of keynote presentations and workshop topics, including customer service and experience lessons we can learn from the Disney parks, leadership lessons we can learn from Walt Disney, and others. Again, you can find everything at loumangelo.com. Thanks, as always, to Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider, whether you're going to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, Disney Cruise Line, Aulani, or any destination. Becky Menken and the entire team of Mouse Fan Travel Advisors treat you like they are a member of their family. It's why we've been partners for more than 17 years. They work for you, they work with you, and it all comes at no cost to you. You can visit them over at mousefantravel.com. And if you like the show, and I hope that you do, all I ask is that you please help spread the word by telling a friend about the show and inviting them to listen. Take a screenshot on your phone, share it on social, tag me at Lou Mangiello. I will reshare it, follow you back. Anything you can do is helpful. And if you want, take just a couple of seconds to rate and review the show over in Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It is very helpful, very much appreciated. I want to thank some recent reviewers like JC, who says, I only found the show a few months ago. I'm in the process of going back and listening to each and every show and newscast. You and your guests have quickly become part of my everyday routine. Thank you. Your knowledge of Disney, incredibly inspiring, optimistic, and positive outlook and inspirational messages are refreshing and entertaining. You are the best out there. Thank you for all you do. Well, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you for taking the time to listen this every week. 
being part of the community, being part of the conversation, being part of my extended family, and for hopefully being part of the positive difference and change that can happen one day, one person, one interaction at a time by choosing the good, by finding the good in everything and everybody that you encounter. Remember, every day might not be good, but there's always something good to find in every day. All you have to do is look for it. I love you. I appreciate you. I hope you enjoy the additions to the show feed that are coming. I hope to see you this and every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern for WWE Live. And if there's ever anything I can do to help you, to say thank you to you, please reach out and let me know. I love you. Have an amazing week. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou, it's Patrice Roberti calling from Arlington, Mass. I am calling to say that you are a very sweet person, and that picture on your website of you as a little boy, it seems that you became uh, a very nice man as well. I have I have often thought that since you've spoke about not having a lot of friends as a young man, how wonderful it is that the universe has given you so many friends now, people who you really seem to enjoy and who enjoy you. I do have one bone to pick with you. You often refer to yourself as an Ewok, but those Ewoks, they seem kind of grumbly, and you're not grumbly. I think you should refer to yourself as a Wally, because he's cheery and charming and happy and optimistic, and that sounds like you. Excuse me. Take care. Bye. Hello, Lou. This is Carrie McCopper from Crestwood, Kentucky, and I just listened to your places to walk around Walt Disney World, and I loved them. You got some of my favorite. Um, Porter Leeds is one of my very favorite, too, but you forgot... Another of my very favorite ones, or maybe just wasn't mentioned, is um, all of the little walks around the uh, Animal Kingdom Lodge. I love them. Plus, there's fantastic food there. Um, the the main lodge has um, a wonderful little walk to the, I think it's the Pembe Safari. And um, right now, the baby Okapi is there. You could go and see him with his mom, and it's uh darling and there's always somebody there to tell you about the animals there you do have to walk past the uh, survival of the fittest restrooms which was a little bit terrifying to my kids but i think it just means <laughs> i think survival of the fittest is just their gym and it just happens to name their restrooms now. but anyway um but the, you go right past that past the pool and it's a pretty little walk to go down to the um the little uh savannah there um not so far savannah so um, but there's also other little savannas all around Animal Kingdom Lodge, and there's quiet walks, and there's benches, and there's uh, people, that uh, educators that will tell you about the different animals. Um, and then if you go over to um, the BBC for them, um, there's just that little walk out to that fire pit right by Sana. So fantastic places to eat um, at both of those properties, and then those little walks, which are quiet and peaceful with animals, and they're really pretty. Um, Love listening to you. Uh, have a great day and uh, uh, have a wonderful time with your Disney uh, adventures. Hi, Lou. I listened to your show about Hollywood uh, studio music, and I was so excited to hear about you talking about the um, Hunchback of Notre Dame show. I saw that years ago. It was like 19, I mean, 2001, something like that. Anyway, it was a great show. I love the music, and also, I stuck around after the show because they had a they, during the show they had a, a big heart a a, a big uh, heart that was made out of like a uh, a uh, a card a big playing card and they tore it in half and that represented uh, the hunchback's broken heart but anyway he dropped it on the ground and after the show I hung out after everybody left and the guy came out and he was sweeping the floor and I said hey can I have that heart and he gave it to me. And I put it in my scrapbook, and it was like the best souvenir I ever got from uh, Disney World. And I still have it in that scrapbook. And anyway, I was so excited when you brought that show up because it was only there for a little while, and it was a great little show. Anyway, thank you, Lou, for everything you do. Bye-bye.